A very good morning to all of you. Uh, and I welcome you to the Dean's 70th Anniversary Lecture Series of the School of International Studies. The antecedents of it we trace back to October 1955, when the Indian School of International Studies was born, even before JNU. Uh, the idea of this celebration was the brainchild of our Dean, Professor Amitabh Mattu, uh, who should be joining us in a while. Uh, we had an urgent meeting, so he would be coming uh, a little later. But so far, we have had in the series about five lectures ranging from international studies, international law, economics, India's development. And the last one, which we had just last week, was on Vishwa Shastra, India and the World. We are very pleased today to welcome Professor T.V. Paul, who is an alumni of SIS. At present, he is Distinguished McGill Professor, Department of Political Science at McGill University and is also the founding director of Global Research Network on Peaceful Change. He has been founding director of the Center for International Peace and Security Studies uh, at Montreal, and he's been visiting professor, scholar at I mean, several places in the world, including Taipei, Stanford University, universities at Tokyo, Singapore, Vienna, California, Hawaii, Harvard, and more. And he's won several honors among them, the latest, I think, or the most recent, is the establishment of the TV Paul Lecture Series in Peace and Security. Actually, the most recent one is going to be the International Security Studies Distinguished Scholar Award. It's usually oh, going to white people now. First time, first time a Global South guy is getting it. So, that was a good one. He's won several awards, ranging again from Brain Gain Distinguished Scholar in 2023 and erudite fellow both by the kerala state higher education council to uh, best professor in international relations he was also included in the <coughs> a list of uh, 41 most influential indo-canadians and friends of india in toronto this paul's uh, research focus includes international security ir ir theory Asia, rising powers, particularly India, and uh, comparative politics, South Asia. He has innumerable books, of course, and articles on uh, several, I mean, from great powers, regional transformation, IR theory, etc. But his latest book um, is what he is going to be speaking to us uh, on today, The Unfinished Quest, India's Search for Major Power Status, from Nehru to Modi. So chairing this session is uh, Professor Sahadevan. Professor P. Sahadevan is the chair of the Center for South Asian Studies. Uh, he specializes on Sri Lankan and Maldivian studies, peace and conflict, terrorism, and strategic <coughs> studies. He's been visiting fellow at several universities, including South Asia Institute, Heidelberg, Germany, Ford Foundation fellow at Indiana, Colombo, at Colombo in Sri Lanka, University of Kent, UK, among others. So I'm going to be handing over the proceedings to him. But before I do that, I'll request you to please uh, felicitate uh, our uh, guest of, the, of honor today with a small token of our appreciation. No, no, just give it like this so that photograph. <laughs> I won't open it to see what it is. <laughs> <laughs> so over to you, Professor Sadhan. Thank you, Professor Hussain. Good morning, everyone. It's indeed a great pleasure and a privilege to welcome Professor T.B. Paul to our school and the university. I know everyone knows that Professor Paul is an accomplished scholar of international repute um, and also a distinguished alumnus of our school. And you're very fortunate that Professor Paul is visiting the school when you are celebrating the 70th, you know, 70th year of our anniversary of the school. And um, as Priti said, I think this is the sixth lecture in the series. And uh, today's lecture is going to be on India, India's rise for a status in the international system. I think it's, it's always a dispute whether India is a rising power or is a great power. And certainly, it's beyond. It is, it's more than the uh, regional power. 
I think um, in order to really sort of uh, understand the complexities and challenges that India faces in its terms of its rise, I think that we have a because Paul to really sort of uh, enlighten us the status that India enjoys in the international system. Without further ado, I, let me invite Professor Paul to be part of the new delivery selection. Thank you, Preeti. Thank you, Sadevan. All of our colleagues and friends sitting here, many of you over the years, really uh, enriched me, and uh, I'm glad I'm back here. The school really made a big deal in my life, so I, I have, I'm, I'm really indebted to you. And uh, many of us who studied here have fond memories, although we were penniless at that point, but that still, the school uh, gave a chance for many people who did well later. So I, um, um, I think I think I will talk more about the book. This book took me a long time to finish, partly because of COVID, <laughs> but then I, my own other projects intervened. It's been a dream to write about it since I dabbled in IR theory for a bit. And so here it is. So the question is uh, whether we can apply some of the international relations theories to study India's rise and make it uh, easy to read. So I've come to a conclusion that after you get your promotions and the tenure and all that, you should write for the general audience too, or informed audience rather than just for your peer group. The problem with the peer group, they may or may not read it, you know, but at least some others <laughs> will be interested in what you do. So that's why the book is written in a way that um, most people found it easy to read. And I have editors who sharpened it a little bit here and there. But so after five days, and India is now viewed as a rising power or a rising power category. And this happened as a result to great extent, the sustained GDP growth rate of <laughs> six to seven percent. The nuclear test, which some people at that time thought would uh, uh, make India a pariah state in the international help to get out of the fence sitter mode. And the members 20 BRICS. And India's own ambition is very clear from the current dispensation. Uh, this is the primary goal of India's uh, India state and the people. And all US presidents, George W. Bush, uh, um, have recognized that India has uh, is rising. And uh, in fact, Obama said in the Indian parliament that uh, India has indeed risen, which probably whether that was a, a correct statement. So the question is, um, India is definitely a rising power, we know. And that, um, but what is a rising power? Why do you want to rise? You know, all these issues become very pertinent in uh, our understanding of the subject matter. So that's where I start. Why do countries seek status or higher ranking in the hierarchical international system. And then there are a number of puzzles in the Indian case, because since 1947, this desire has been there, although sometimes they expressed it in these many words. The word great power or major power was rarely used, but leading power, yes. And when the per capita income was less than $300. By the way, China was the same boat, but somehow, well, I'll talk about that story a little later. But there was indeed a historical belief that uh, this has been a significant actor and denied its uh, legitimate position in the world ordering system, colonial order, racialized a great power system. And it was indeed only Europeans had any chance to be in that club. So Ottoman Empire, although very powerful, who had no, no role except occasionally they were invited to Vienna and places like that. So this system was indeed racialized and uh, the acceptance of other civilization, other modernities, as we call it, was very difficult uh, in the European system. So the question is, what is status? And there is a literature now, I'm proud to say I'm one of the people who pushed that literature We an edited volume called Status in World Politics, if you ever get a chance, a Cambridge book with Deborah Larson and um, um, and then uh, colleagues, uh, but there are chapter. There's a one chapter on India, and uh, William Wolford, the, the second editor. 
So that book actually did very well. And even today, a lot of graduate students want to work with me partly because of that book. And so they write to me, can I come and work on that anyway? So that is uh, the motivated and try to see the Indian case a little bit more, uh, more closely. What is status? Uh, we define in that book, it's collective beliefs about a country's ranking in terms of valued attributes. Collective ranking, collective beliefs about a country's ranking in terms of valued attributes. So that places it in a specific strata in, the, in a hierarchical order. So there's an assumption that there is hierarchy, even though most of us don't want personally like the word hierarchy, but unfortunately it is there. International system definitely has that. So like beauty, status, status is in the eye of the beholder. I cannot say I have status. You have to recognize it. Professors sometimes declare they have status. I mean, when they use the word uh, distinguished professor and all that, it's a, it's a status recognition. But sometimes you feel like, actually, Raja Mohan once told me that that means extinguished professor, isn't it? So, it's funny to understand his viewpoint on this. So, but in any case, this idea of uh, status is, it is in the perceptions of others. And that is where the problem arises, which I will come to you in. It's a recognized identity by other people, other states, other institutions. So then I go into comprehensive national power, which actually draws from a previous work I did with Baldev Raj Nayar. In, I know JNU students used to like that book, India in the World Order. Still available, by the way, yes. right here. And I have, uh, we used 10 comprehensive. By the way, Baldev passed away a couple of years ago. Many of you knew him, and he's one of my favorite people in the world. He was such a wonderful man to me, and you know him as a scholar, too. Comprehensive national power elements uh, are important here. In the previous eras, especially the European era, a great power was the state that could hurt, that could deprive, that could provide security to others. And Jack Levy uses this sort of definition as narrowly focused on security provider, security denier, uh, country that can deny uh, security. Susan Strange broadened it to include um, economics, a uh, country with the highest um, um, capacity in goods and services, dissemination of knowledge, etc. So, but still military power matters, and uh, we need to look at it as a comprehensive national power with hard power issues as a subject like military, economic, technological, demographic, and then, of course, soft power, no military position in the world system, leadership in international organization, culture, state capacity, strategy, diplomacy, etc. So, and added to that is effective national leadership. And so soft power, as you know, Joseph and I all talk about the power of attraction. So a rising power, I'm using Manjari Miller's definition, actually another product of this university, I believe. <laughs> um, it possesses most significant ingredients of these elements, begin to globalize his interest beyond the region, begin to gain recognition, and has this notion of a major power identity. And so that is when we start look at other indicators. You probably are familiar with the Lowy Institute's uh, annual Asia Power Index, and they use something similar in a different manner. And uh, they put uh, used to put India below Japan. Now I think it is uh, number three this year's one. So China and uh, really US, China, India. So that is a slight progress there. And um, so the, the question is, this idea is it dated? Do we really need this category? Or is it an inevitable um, historical situation that it is going through? Definitely, it's changing the whole understanding of what a great power means. The Europeans made it, as I said, very exclusive club. But today, the, that has changed. And so countries are pushing, or what do you call uh, status push. And it's difficult to obtain. Uh, wh why is it so difficult today's world to become a traditional great power? That's because it's great difficulty to obtain that sphere of influence. A great power is known for its military, economic, political sphere of influence. 
And of course, the colonial powers had territorial uh, connections too. In second ranking states, without another term to use here, nationalism is very powerful. And so they have more agency, which was not the case even during the Cold War. We can talk about this dramatic change in international politics, which European based or American scholars haven't yet recognized, I think. So this problem of this sphere of influence can clash with the other norm in international arena called territorial integrity norm as well as sovereignty norm. So that norm, uh, parallel norms are progressing. But what you're witnessing in the Ukraine conflict, for instance, is that <coughs> conflict between the two norms. And over time, the great powers sometimes supported these norms, but then they realize they lose their sphere of influence. They go back to their good old ways of coercive, coercive assertion. So it is a challenge to gain territory and then get it recognized by others. That's what uh, Putin faced in, you know, the conquered Crimea, but only three countries recognized that, that conquest 2014, partly because um, even though Crimeans voted in big favor for joining the Russian Federation. So where is the theoretical base of this discussion? There is something called social identity theory. Deborah Larson, one of my co-authors, editors, and friend, actually, she's probably the pioneering scholar today on the subject. There are three mechanisms she talks about, social mobility, emulating others successfully, social competition, efforts to outdo others, social creativity, pushing a new criteria for membership. And it, some of them may be applicable to India in many cases. Then the question is, why do you need status? It's like a, Sometimes some people say, I'm very happy with what I am. I don't need more status. But others would say that, no, this is a very human problem. There is an intrinsic psychological value. It fulfills social cravings like deference, respect. Collective self-esteem is important for large entities, especially those entities who feel humiliated in the past. Okay, we can go into that psychological aspect later. But there is material benefit too which is often buried underneath the discussion. You, if you are recognized great power, you have increased capabilities, special rights like membership in P5, and opportunities to shape others' destinies. Okay, so clubs where you shape sometimes others' destiny of the lower ranking actors. It was easier in the past, but much less so today. But the point is, you still can be the shaper of regional orders, world orders in their own manner. And then there is an advantage called electoral advantage if you're a democracy. And uh, it brings dividends to the leader who pursues it. And I don't need to go further on that subject. You know what I'm talking about. So uh, Indian elections were definitely fought on this subject too. And I think it helped the ruling party to some extent. Then there is something I pull out in this book that is called the moral right, which I think is not understood by Western scholars at all in this discussion on status. It is rectifying past humiliations. In Chinese case, it was 100 years of humiliation. But the Indian case, now I think it's a 1,000 years of humiliation, which you know what I'm talking about, too. So, but in Nehru's time, it was the, the desire to help others who were humiliated by the colonial world order. So Nehru would go do things um, as a duty, as someone who gained independence through a nonviolent struggle. It is our duty to help those who are still colonized. Now, that doesn't come across as a, some kind of a narrow material goal. It was more like the need for changing the order in, in our pursuit of this thing. So, the moral right also comes from this notion of raising a fallen people. You know that famous book that uh, um, your colleague wrote about, or edited book. Um, and Lee, there's a duty to help colonize people. And that, I think, is more. Why do countries do certain things? There is an ideological belief, but that is more than that. Then, of course, the civilizational basis. Um, we hear a lot about it today, of course. Uh, there is a lot of uh, elements of truth in that. 
that India has been a contributed to much to human advancement. Um, you must have, some of you must have read and criticized uh, Darren Paul's latest uh, book <laughs> and listened to his Empire podcast. The guy was asking somebody, what do you think of the book? And they said, uh, he had already written about it, but I think he has done a good job in telling this story, whether many of you agree or disagree with it. But I think the book is doing very well, thanks to his podcast. In any case, he calls the word endosphere, which I don't think was there before. Again, that is not in the dictionary, I tell you. It's uh, interesting. So this idea that um, uh, this civilization contributed to a um, large part of Indo-Pacific. And Huntington puts it one of the seven civilizations. And anybody who's, who deals with multiple modernities definitely have to go into that idea. And so this, I think this uh, idea is uh, very powerful. Although one challenge is grand civilizations, there were quite a few in the past. You know, you had Greece, you have uh, Turkey, Ottomans, you have uh, Egypt, which is one of the oldest civilizations, but does that automatically give this incentive? But I think the size of a state and size of its continuity all matter in that context. So one problem with this uh, idea of uh, status is it can generate different perceptions and misperceptions. Because as I said, it is in the eye of the others and the status seeker can misperceive its position, where it achieved, how it can achieve. Others can misperceive too, sometimes not knowing what this is all about. So this notion of ascribed versus aspired. Ascribed is what others ascribe to you, and aspire is what you aspire. And there is there can be huge discrepancies in this uh, between the two and that's when you have violent conflicts in international order and intense nationalism and internal violence too and there is something called misrecognition recognition doesn't come easily and entities can feel humiliated putin Russia is a great case of that and that generates identity crisis to the society what are we after and so the IR theory of our transition, Graham Allison's, you know, all those narrowly focused on the power element of it, not discussing the socio-psychological element of status, which is what is missing in the literature. But still it is useful to at least understand that these power transitions have been violent in human history. 12 out of 16 power transitions since 1500 produced by war and post-war settlements. So as capabilities increase, states expect higher status. Established powers don't often accommodate. And so for some states, it's their status loss, in Russia's case. For others, it's a mixture of China, old status, now new status. Japan and Germany in the 1900s, obviously, was pushing for higher status. Established groups are reluctant to admit new members and this is a problem in every hierarchical system, whether it is class, caste, race, gender, because it's a club good. You don't want new members in it. <coughs> you bring new members into it, you lose your own power and uh, status, not power, status. That's why doctors groups in the Western countries, I don't know about here, but often are very clubby. You know, they don't want any new members easily taken into their club. Same with professional groups, lawyers and all that. So as a result, in Canada, we have a very shortage of uh, GPs, general practitioners. So foreign graduates, very talented ones, end up as taxi drivers because they really have to pass multiple hurdles on this. So maybe there is a material reason too, but it is clearly a status issue of losing one's position. And I don't need to go into class conflict racial conflicts over status, make America great again, MAGA, <laughs> what do they want really? <laughs> is it is it simply a grocery price? I think no, it is a lot more than that. Something else is happening. So established groups are reluctant and uh, they also tend to edit 
the contributions of the lower ranking groups. So history books and often highlight the cultural importance of the dominant group. And this is a big problem in the Western countries too. That we rarely address this problem. In fact, my daughters study history at Quebec in school system. And the Quebec history books are all about the French Canadians. Nothing about the English. But the English defeated them that they cannot tolerate. So my wife went to the US school system and she said there was a little bit of discussion about European cultures, but it's all about American Revolution. Lincoln was a great man, you know, all that stuff. Completely ignoring how racist it became after Lincoln, you know, the Jim Crow period is not discussed at all in the textbooks of family. That's when they lost everything. I mean, the blacks. This editing phenomenon, by the way, is very powerful in um, class systems, caste systems, race. The writing on women by men, you know, you know, think about how much we edit other people's or, or different societies. And this is how status is permanently made entrenched by established groups. So the catalyst for change often comes through external or internal shocks, leadership change, war, thought, or you become how China became accepted to the United States when Nixon and Kissinger went to Beijing and decided uh, Russia, Soviet Union. And same goes for India to some extent after the rise of China and the George Bush uh, condolences as a possible balancing force. So that is a, a challenge because sometimes it doesn't work out exactly what uh, the country that is hoping to become, but still it is a, a process that is going on. I discuss a little bit this one. I will go very quickly. India's status markers, quite a bit of discussion. Hard power, military, economic, technology, and I think economics is the number one I would call the GDP, the raw material there. So I have an interesting discussion about the status conflict over nuclear non-proliferation regime, nuclear treaties that India became um, perhaps the strongest opponent of the NPT. And this dimension of status is very critical there. Again, not understood, appreciated in the extend IR literature. That India opposed this treaty because it would have permanently made the system India losing that status uh, possibility, and that uh, I didn't want. So why India alone? I mean, there are a few others, but none of them this strongly. So that is a subject matter worth understanding the, the status dimension of that uh, whole conflict. And I argue that the 1998 test was a status assertion by the BJP government at the time. Opposing the NPT and CTBT, you may recall, were a big part of that time. And the U.S. cooperation, U.S. understanding accommodation was possible only when U.S. recognized that India's aspiration cannot be pushed aside. This is a nuclear weapon state. So this is a big part of that story that is yet to be. Uh, Perkovich has some discussion without any theory about this status. Uh, issue. Um, demographic dividend is another thing which I think is uh, underutilized. Let me be a little critical here. This is, I think, India's number one asset. But it is unfortunately not in uh, in a position. SDI weakness, you know that. And I, the key argument of the book is, yes, you can get diplomatic recognition, you can get a lot of other things, but the legitimate I'm Critical, but I'm not trying to say this is only for India. It is the low attention given to mass education, healthcare, and that has a lot of reasoning, which I won't go in at this point. So the power of attraction, that's a soft power. And of course, uh, some of them be strengths and weakness, and they are all undergoing changes. And of course, the political system, a, a bit of a discussion about non-alignment as a status seeking strategy, uh, Bantung onwards. Then, of course, today's uh, 
multi-alignment, the idea of strategic autonomy again having a place in the international system. I discussed a little bit with the diaspora, their strengths and weaknesses, and whether they contribute to this status. Uh, and how status-oriented are they? I'd like to talk to especially Indian engineers and techies, and they will tell you that I want to make India a strong country. Now, this is a desire more than uh, people he living here to for living abroad because they have that goal. They don't know how to get there, which is another story which we can talk about. Then, of course, I uh, and this book is meant for helping people to understand why such difficulties to pull out get faster than it should be, and I put the weak state capacity. And I think it is also the most unequal rising power, perhaps in history. And uh, structural issues are there. And so you have a big income inequality, but not all great powers have solved all their internal equality issues. But the biggest challenge here is if you have a pre-existing <laughs> such huge dis disparity, then it's much harder for that uh, segment of the population to come up. And then I also think that this bureaucratic element of status class is much higher in Indian thinking, partly because of the caste system. But the clearly, bureaucrats, do they really imbibe this idea of a great power and willing to work for it? That, I think, is a big difference with China, where the Communist Party instills in them, your role is very important, even the lower ranking bureaucrat that you can't keep that folder too long under your desk for whatever reason. To my mind, maybe I'm wrong, you have the top elite very much uh, in this mode, but going down the lower elite levels to the village, to the panchayat, do they think in terms of a great power means my road has to be working, my drainage has to, I shouldn't be the source of uh, inhibiting that growth of the country. Anyway, worth discussing that aspect. So inclusive economic development, the absence of a developmental state attitude uh, did not follow the East Asian model even after the liberalization. Infrastructure, yes, there is some big ticket items have done well. But then the issue of quality of life and uh, um, India definitely needs to work on livability, life uh, index, quality of life index. Um, SDI ranking must go below the 132 right now. It's a very low rank. So the big question is whether the GDP growth rate is reflecting in this quality of life parameters. And that's where I did a comparison with other rising powers of their times. And I find that they put a lot of emphasis on internal development. Think of uh, Peter the Great, Bismarck. Bismarck is the one who brought the welfare state, by the way to educate the, uh, the soldier to fight better. The Meiji Restoration, all about internal improvements and then external expansion, of course. The uh, Great Society of Roosevelt, um, even um, Johnson's uh, period. All those suggest that Status, people realize, leaders realize that status will come if you have internal development to show that you are a better run society, your model is worth emulating, you have something to offer to the world order. So I think the problem here, I think, is the low spending on education and public health, which I still haven't understood why it's such difficulty to spend more than less than 3% on GDP on education. And if you look at every country that pulled out their population from poverty or development is when they spend at least six to eight percent of the GDP on education, not just spending alone, quality education. The latest is, of course, China, with actually spending less money, but it has done quite well. This aspect is, um, I don't know how much you discussed this, how to bring the masses education and quality education, very critical for a sustained rise and importance as a great power in the world. Anyway, I don't need to tell you all the challenges that India faces, but let me go to the international challenge, which is actually something, again, the contribution of this book, I would think, which is the latecomer problem in status ascription. 
And that happened because in 1945 in San Francisco, the last time the world order was struck, India was a colony and it missed the boat. And there was no proper push for India. A few countries like Australia and Canada also was suggesting let us bring India as a uh, permanent member. The fact that 2.5 million Indian soldiers is the largest contingent of any country, any of the colonies, I believe. And that uh, was did not work out. So this is a topic I encourage people to do more research, especially those of you who are into historical IR. Why didn't India push for? There must be reasons that the nationalist leaders were in jail, many of them, because this is a Quit India period. My own hunch is that the Quit India movement really bothered the British. The British became so angry that they didn't want to give India any chance to be a member of this council. I'm, I'm guessing, by the way, I, I'm sure Professor Muni is sitting here with a lot of knowledge on the subject. MS Rajan has written about it, very short paragraphs, but uh, I caught him a lot in that. And uh, actually, in 1990, India had better representation. There were three Maharajas plus Major. And in Bretton Woods system, we India played quite a bit of role too. But when it came to this San Francisco Treaty, China got inducted because the US wanted China. As so India missed. India missed about in 1968 when the Nuclear Non Proliferation Treaty was concluded. India did not test the bomb before 67, January 1st or something, the cutoff date. So it now branded as a non nuclear weapon state. A second category, it's ranking. Think about that. So, I argue these two milestone moments were critical and beyond the control of India to some extent. But the point is, international orders is not geared for easy change, peaceful change, as we say. It requires a war. Uh, you know, you have three big changes <laughs> the Congress of Vienna after Napoleonic Wars, the Versailles Treaty after. Uh, World War One, then the UN after World War Two, and of course uh, we have now more incremental changes after the financial crisis. Other institutions are created, but it is very difficult to change the institutional architecture of the dominant dominant institutional of the day. And I mentioned that the great power system was very much um, European. Now I go into this problem of China as a primary challenger to India in a few minutes. But I think the India-Pakistan, India-China, India-US accommodation um, is very important here. And I think Clinton de-hyphenated Pakistan. Bush got out of nuclear apartheid, and it was a major accommodation. Obama explicitly recognized. Biden continued to support, although reluctant to criticize India on some issues, Russia policy publicly. And a number of agreements making India a swing power role today. I won't the discussion. How long time I have? Five more minutes? Five, ten more minutes? Yeah. So the emerging balance of power offers India quite opportunities. But it is important to think about acceptance by a peer group is very important to get recognition. And I think China is the number one challenger in that. And this is partly due to perceptual discrepancies. Technologists who doesn't give India any role in that discussion, especially since the 1960s. And then the historical dimensions go into that. China's challenge today is uh, sphere of influence. And China's insertion into South Asia and forcing India to status share, share the status with China since the 2010s through aid development infrastructure, and the small states are competing and bargaining despite this huge asymmetry in power. I have a little article in politics journal on this subject, how the small states bargain with these two, which is a big change. I mean, during the Cold War, the some states bargain, but this bargaining by Maldives is very interesting, isn't it? It shows that they have some agency as the system is not yet uh, deeply polarized. So then I have a whole section on um, the core challenger of, uh, with Pakistan. 
and the impact of the 62 war presidency with the US when it accommodated was very high. In fact, the US to accommodate in China. So the Chinese worries are obviously you all know that India is a powerful swing state. If it forms a hard balancing coalition, it could really upset China's goal of becoming the dominant uh, prime minister. Hoping when the US relative how many two centuries to evolve. So this revolution in ecological revolution, revolution in military affairs could be very rapid. And that's where you really have to be careful how not to miss it again. And the India-US relations are interesting. So if the world order becomes a multiplex one, multipolar or whatever, multiplex is what Amit Avajari uses the word. And there I think the key is to how to gain legitimacy and durable status. So hard power, sometimes people mistakenly think that is enough. You become automatically recognized. No. Recognition takes a lot of diplomatic efforts, lots of uh, conviction. <coughs> Military power alone or economic power is not enough. How to gain legitimacy and durable status is something that we still need to think about. Engagement is very important. That engagement should include uh, intellectuals, scholars. So shutting off world from India is not a good idea because you really, a rising power need to engage others to sell your ideas. Even if you're using civilizational prism, you need takers for that argument. And that is where you need to rethink about bringing people to India. You know, there's nothing to be afraid of. There's no need to be defensive about it. How to gain legitimacy, how to make a difference to world order. Here, rhetoric alone is not enough. I think you need a concrete plan of action. How to navigate the new world called war. How to get there without war. And so, I mean, so far, some of the strategies I, I think have quite done very well because how to. One thing I forgot to mention is why the India Russia relations are so much better. It is that Russians are one of the few people in among the great powers that recognized India's status early on. This is the 60s. And uh, this the Americans did not understand. How much uh, it mattered when the Russian leaders receiving Indira Gandhi or uh, leaders like that, and giving the Indians a feel of, that you are an important player in the world for so their own selfish reasons, probably. But and I think that is a big part of this discussion that is missing in today's uh, world. And only when the U.S. recognized that that was part of India's problem, a problem with the U.S. This estrangement was not purely material, it was also psychological revolution. So how to navigate, and there is another problem of internal status discrepancy, international implications, and it, can India build a, a development paradigm, especially in this emerging order, where recognized interdependence, as somebody was using the other day, is fast becoming a problem with this Trump strategy. And so status recognition would require more than just material gains, astute diplomacy, <coughs> playing sophisticated games, and massive improvement in the domestic capacity of the state, including using the demographic dividend, the number one asset India has. Let me stop there, of course, you have questions. Thank you, Paul. I think it's a very insightful presentation. You brought in various theories to define the status of our past and international system. You made a very comparative analysis for where does India stand in different cases. And also, I think that you brought it very clearly. I think that normally, I think it has to be looked at India as a status quo is far, but I think it's a state which is always in the focus of seeking status. Um, that subsequently started even during the Nehru's time. So that's the case of a big state uh, on the Nehru seeking an international status as a great power. The journey that actually, actually began, but seems to be reached at about the or that's what you said, that the first part of great power status. Uh, you also talked about the various challenges India facing in terms of its 
uh, in obtaining the status. And uh, so that she is very well capable, I think that we need to have a very domestic capacity as a prelude to really see its status and recognition. Also, what then do they get the feeling? I think when Obama came and as I said, India's reason already, it seems to be a reflectory rhetoric rather than a substantive recognition of India's status. I think states also recognize in order to gain their stability, born they just to be from the regime or the state. Um, also, I think it's very clear, I think that the most critical are you know, sort of the formidable challenges that India faces in the neighborhood, Pakistan, China, all the major challenges, certainly. Um, I think the point is, I think that you really sort of tend to really sort of uh, come to a conclusion. I think India is rising, but perhaps the rising to be a quasi great power may not be a full uh, great power. It might only take ages to really attain the goal. Uh, but it's a hopeful of really sort of reaching the stage. Um, I think the uh, the number of things uh, you raised, I think there is a lot of answers perhaps available in the book. The book is also released to the available uh, South Asia and should really get you a copy for 500 rupees. So please buy it. <laughs> Less than 500 rupees. Less than 500 rupees. <laughs> <laughs> so I think the floor is open now. I think the plenty of questions perhaps you have in mind. And identify yourself briefly and certainly ask your questions and make it. It was very, very unusual for JMU. I don't know what happened. <laughs> 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 They're still absorbing. Yes. yes. Let me take a few uh, questions for the colleagues and then move on to the uh, students. Uh, so, sorry, you would like to come in. <laughs> I mean, I think uh, Steve is really the, the, the ideal person to have written a book like this because he's been grappling intellectually with, with with precisely these questions of of status and of power, transition and transformation for a very long time. And I mean, our, our view uh, actually coincided a great deal. So there isn't, there isn't much really here by way of, you know, uh, by, way of, by, by way of even critical kind of engagement in the sense that sort of, you know, when you agree a lot with another scholar, you essentially, you know, just keep nodding along. Uh, and that's what I found myself doing. Um, I guess um, my, my, my key issue would be uh, perhaps to ask about this question of geographical location that you signal. Uh, because I think, I think that's, that's really interesting. But I'm wondering whether, you know, when we are dismissive, for instance, of the Brazilians, uh, I think that's the country, in fact, perhaps even more than China. That, that, that in some sense sort of, you know, uh, I think uh, parallels in their journey. Uh, and, and, you know, we, we dismiss the Brazilians very, very easily. Uh, but I think that does display to some extent collectively a Northern Hemisphere bias. That sort of in a way we, we don't believe that geopolitics has really entered the Southern Hemisphere. Uh, and my suggestion is that, I mean, looking ahead, we probably need to ask whether that is now really the case. China has already entered the sort of It's not just China entered, but, but I mean, there are essentially two grand projects for the Western Hemisphere. Uh, you know, there is the US project, which is to ultimately integrate the entire Western Hemisphere into a single kind of region. And then you have the alternate Brazilian project, which is to say that yes, there will be an integrated process, but there will be integrated processes, there will be two. Right? And I think, I think in thinking about it in terms of major challenges geopolitically and geoeconomically, that's one of the most fundamental challenges actually facing the United States, which their leadership incidentally is completely blindly unaware of. Their think tanks and academics don't think a lot about society. But that's the whole Monroe Doctrine thinking that still sort of pervades the way you look at that. So I get back to this question of, of geography. Um, and I want to sort of probably push you a bit, you know, since you're looking ahead, you're ending on the kind of note of, sort of you know, the future. Uh, what about some of those spaces that we today see as global commons, but which are likely to be less and less global commons as we go on? Uh, I'll just signal two right now: outer space and Antarctica. Uh, you know, uh, you know. I think I think for for a lot of these these emerging slash rising powers, uh, that question of their rise is also linked to some extent to that. The historical analogy I'll point you towards is the scramble for Africa. 
you know, uh, the scramble for Africa and what it did to many of the European countries that were jockeying for great power status. A tiny country like Belgium could go and occupy the geographical heart of Africa and, you know, the horrible King Leopold and everything that he did, uh, you know, and so on. So, I mean, I'm sorry I've gone on. I, I, was, I was not actually afraid of the question. Uh, Saha just put me on the spot, so I said something. Please pick up with it. I think it's a fascinating area. I, I, I didn't hear at all. And education. It was our type, by the way. And the, and the inability to use universities for R&D, yes. Silicon Valley, Jesus, you know, Stanford University. The Americans have, that's one of the greatest things they have done is the R&D development is happening university to industry back and forth. Here I think the industrial houses have their own R&D and then a few of the science houses. I was told that the IITs are slowly changing it. That should have been done long time back. The IITs remain as these teaching institutions, fantastic institutions, yes, but why not use that for applied uh, R&D, research and development on human problems that the country faces. And this, uh, uh, the book has a, quite a critical segment on that, the IITs. They haven't, I mean, now they are doing a bit more. Why they haven't produced the scientific uh, development that, development-oriented science. And the Indian science has been more theoretical rather than applied, as far as I know. You know I mean, there must have been some cultural reasons for that. So there is a lot of truth in that. So spending, yeah, absolutely. And I don't know anyone can enlighten here. The AI spending, I am not sure India is doing enough. And it is very scary, <laughs> to be honest, without AI and other cutting edge. See, India did worry about nuclear and space as the cutting edge technology of the day in the 40s onwards. And now the cutting edge technology is something else, which were our challenges. And then, of course, developing new products for the world. The Chinese figured that out, of course, through various ways they collected the technologies. And that is what is giving them whatever the, the discussion here was China's success. And developing new products, now some products are superior, you know, to the Western products. And that hasn't occurred sufficiently in the Indian case. And that's partly why also the manufacturing sector still remains small for the GDP. So, yeah, I think it's a big question mark. The decision makers have to pause how to bring in the scientific talent, the university talents to R&D, how to increase the domains where India can do better. Not every domain is easy to replicate. Yeah, the, the, the diaspora is a big challenge. To have multiple types of diasporas, and some of them carry the conflicts they have here back to these countries. And the countries themselves sometimes not able to comprehend properly. The Can Canadian case is a very good example. And play the game with them for electoral politics or whatever. So we are in a very mix, but the diaspora overall is very much for India's rights, if you look at even the Hindu diaspora, or Hindu third diaspora is for a different kind of India, but clearly they are also all, even people like me, you know, I like India to do well, but when India does well, I do well, okay, or for as a diaspora person. If India is getting bad name, like in Canada today, they look, they stare at me as another Indian who is doing harm to their people or whatever. So it affects you personally more than you think. India's rise is important. And as someone who studied in the U.S. in the, the thick of the non-proliferation game, I tell you, I personally felt they stare at you when they are talking about, oh, you are the problem maker. <laughs> but today that is gone, which is a big relief, isn't it? Why don't you can tell me, I mean, maybe when you go to conferences, you know. Uh, so India must do well for the diaspora and vice versa. And I think the politics of these diaspora and back home and they take that to their home countries, the diaspora does it poorly, and uh, hopefully that won't happen worse than in the Canadian system because Canada's popular Indian diaspora population is changing, but the political power is with a small group in concentrated constituencies. Others, the newcomers are spread out, they're not interested much in politics. But if there is mobilization on the other side, 
you can get some of the conflict that you will find in India back there in Canada and it's the Canadians are not equipped they don't have an understanding of Indian history partition mm. nothing <coughs> it's very disappointing to talk to them even how much you know about the two largest conflicts of nation destroying happened in South Asia from Canada and now I'm sounding like a Canadian critic and this <laughs> one I would criticize them for not understanding the dynamic. It's lack of understanding, honestly, and they have their peculiar way of liberal understanding, which is the Wilsonian idea of, uh, you know, countries, people who want to separate, they should have the right, without realizing what does that mean, you know, for a society that faced that separation in the past. So, I do have serious issues with that, but there are limitations how far you can say, without causing dual loyalty problems. <laughs> Yeah, we need first and then I'll come back to Arun. So, so it appears that there's a sort of over-reliance on soft power elements when it comes to respect for great power status by India. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, well, soft power was Nehru's biggest thing. <laughs> he knew he didn't have the power to changed the order, the economy was in shambles, he needed help from everyone. So, in fact, uh, the whole non-alignment was also based on the idea that uh, you need help from every, every corner possible. So, multi-alignment is also partly the result fact the material capacity would increase if you are aligned or engaging all others. It is very clear, even those who believe in soft power, without hard power there is no soft power. Soft. In fact, soft power could crumble, as happened in 1962. Losing a war took away all that soft power that Nehru was building. And the global south countries were the first to look, out, look down upon India, unfortunately. Not even supporting statements came on many occasions. So, you need both. For legitimation of your hard power into status markers, you need soft power. Otherwise, it's a brute power, you know, it doesn't have anything to add to. So if you look at the successful empires, all of them had some soft power. They, had, they built the Cambridges and the Oxfords and in India's case, let's say Nalandas or Takshashilas for reasons that it gives you, uh, I mean, some of them organically developed. Same with the United States, even Russia, they built. They look at the Chinese, they're building the universities, not in social sciences, but obviously in other disciplines. So I think uh, soft power focus, the other question is, do others recognize that soft power? This is where the eye of the beholder becomes. Sometimes the soft power, person who is saying soft power is enough, may not understand how others view us. Okay, so this is a self-reflection trying to see the secondly, whether the soft power can solve contemporary problems, such as civilizational power. This not just India, everybody who, even the Turks who talk about, can you solve the contemporary problem? Can we get acceptance and recognition from others based on that soft power attribute? Part of the reason is there are many historical civilizations out there. I mentioned the Greeks and the Egyptians. Also, many of them are good food, but Lebanese food is more popular than Indian food, by the way. <laughs> so, it's in Thai food and all that. Is that enough? I think it's, it gives definitely one dimension. And it has value for uh, domestic politics reasons, too, which is sometimes we ignore. Status is not just international alone. It is a domestic self, because the, st the, the, the leader who can project that, um, you know, this is part of it, can gain benefits and they will continue to do that for reasons of electoral or our reasons. So I think it has to be understood that legitima legitimation, legitimization would require good, good soft power. What element of that is depends on the, what soft power is valued in a particular era. Inclusivity or exclusivity or democracy or pluralism, you know, all these are issues. You know, but Today, liberalism is uh, suffering as a result of their excesses. But I think the liberal values may return because humans, if you look at 
Liberalism never was uh, a linear progression. It always ended up in wars, conflict. And the liberals themselves engaged in aggressive warfare, unnecessary warfare. Look at the American British empires. So I think a realistic appraisal of your capabilities, along with soft power, along with how to use those instruments for increasing status and material capacity would be very useful, needed. It's not either or. What are the justice? Small states better off mm. in that they don't have to be obsessed with uh, you know just rising to great powers, integration, a whole bunch of status integration. Mm. They just live in India, Singapore, or New Zealand, or UAE. Mm. That you know you can you can as a state uh, you know obviously you do what you can to guarantee your security. Switzerland does, mm. uh, but you know you you essentially focus your energy. Status curse, you can no, coin it here. Yeah. To be a big state, to be a big state. I'm asking you this question. I mean, you know, yeah, so I, I, I have somebody asking you a normative question. Mm. You know? It's a fascinating question, but if you are running a small state in Europe, the Baltics or even Switzerland, they are worried. <laughs> <laughs> They're worried about this great powers competition coming back. So the Norwegians and the Danish all did very well in many parameters. Partly because the Cold War offered them a particular opportunity, the post-Cold War period of, and they themselves fashioned, and, but they were also victims of great power violence, okay? The World War II, they went to almost, every one of them lost their, you know, the Norwegian resistance, remember that? It's a, so they are actually much more worried than you we think. The Singaporeans are the most insecure people I have met. You talk to their, their uh, refugees. They say, ah, we are doing well, but look, the Japanese came here once, you know. They will show you those hills. In fact, if you visit Singapore, you must go to those, those hills where the Japanese landed, you know, <laughs> and made them miserable, the life for several, three, four years after that. So the small states worry about the international order transition more than sometimes even the big powers. And one thing is that they are also status conscious, but they have other markers. So if you read Economist Livability Index, you know, the top 10 are all these small states. And democracies, by the way. Mm -hmm. The high quality life is more in democracy than anywhere else. And fortunately, the people think that democracy is bad, except China slowly catching up. But so it is a, not a, but they realize that they cannot push the, the great power grandeur. The, the Dutch case is fascinating, isn't it? They gave up the idea of great power once. In fact, Manjari Miller's one case study is that. The Dutch after, they could have continued some more years of great power strategy. They decided, okay, time to come. And the Portugals and the Spain all decided to shrink because it's not worth it after some. It, because of defeat, by the way, thoroughly defeated. And then your state shrank. So, so the problem for small states, they're better off if the system is not polarized, the system is not securitized too much, military competition is less. But if it is an intense military competition, they are asked to take, join, they're now joining Finland, joining NATO, I mean, that's a frontline state, you know, if there's a war. So, 
There are literature now coming about the status-seeking strategies of the small states. There are quite a few. Do any research, you'll find Norwegians writing about their mediation role. Why do they play this role that really don't have any material value for them? It's mostly they gain a respectability in this. And their passports, you know, are valued. The Singaporeans get a lot of things. So strategy is, I think, universal. It depends on how you picture them. And you're absolutely right, if you're a large state, your status ambition is with your peer group, which is not uh, small states. And you want to distinguish from that small state. By the way, India doesn't want to be a Pakistan, no? Equivalent. So that's one. But the one case that uh, we should look at is Indonesia. <laughs> Why this large entity decided? Actually, it's playing a lot more normative, clever games. I was told that it is strategizing a lot, much more than we think, without uh, playing the great power game. It doesn't want to be with China or with the US or become another victim of as happened in the World War situation. So some states refrain from this kind of status gains, thinking that their immediate region their neighbors won't like it, they will treat you as a bully, you know. They, so they want that, that status recognition of the Panchila type, you know. They, they want to be the good citizen of ASEAN. And ASEAN serves all their purposes, removes a lot of security challenges to them, otherwise they're militarizing their relationship with the Malaysia and all these countries. So there are a lot of these um, paradoxical cases and puzzles in international politics. But this problem, as you said, is, is a large state problem, especially when your material power increases, you want to be respected. It's like the neo-rich. I mean, you, you all know what people, there was a time when uh, doctors, you know, when the India, India, India was liberalizing, I remember seeing in the back of the car, doctor with some sign of the medical sign. Then they were showing off the Gucci bags, and this is neo-rich idea. But now if you do that, uh, who cares which watch you wear? I mean, in fact, the watch's functionality is more important than anything else. You know, if you wear a Gucci bag, the immediate thing comes to mind is that this is made in Shanghai or someplace. It's definitely not real. Anyway, I'm going beyond my domain. <laughs> do you have a uh, uh, very uh, quickly? Uh, 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 yeah. Short thing yeah. uh, on this thing, on uh, status and perception and the subjectivity. An important point you said about that, about India was this uh, distributional issue, about the inequality which, you know, is still there. And uh, how much of that then affects this perception point of India? I mean, mm. we're able to do the moon, we're able to do all the other things, but if you're not able to meet this social dimension of mm. within, does that compromise our ability to project and to be taken seriously? Unfortunately, because yes. Now you said about this Canadian problem. The Canadian problem is partly this. How this Canadian elite looks at India is, they will say rising power, but they have great reluctance to say, is it a power that we uh, want to Americans have changed though quite a bit because of their economic and other interactions. Especially those that don't have a good social interaction with India. They may like the Indian diaspora who is doing good work in medical or uh, technology areas, but that's one of my arguments that this is in the perception of the world that they will look at and say that, are you improving your living standards to global standards as other rising powers did in their particular time? And we really need to look into that. We really have to look into that, that if a large segment of society is suffering and then even infrastructure, you see, I don't want to be critical, by the way, I I'm, I'm know India has done a lot. So I have to be careful what I'm saying. But I, I would argue that the three decades of sustained economic growth is not reflected in India's urban planning infrastructure. Yesterday, even the Connaught Place looks quite similar to what I left in 1982. Unfortunately, it didn't help me to, why can't we improve this? That, that's what happened in East Asia. All the countries that grew this level, their infrastructure, the quality of life. Look at what Korea was poorer than India, by the way. Singapore was all very poor places. So that transformation of the maintenance of, I mean, you had uh, uh, this Asia and then 
the city was much interesting, but it didn't last. The maintenance of it is very difficult for India. Why is that so? I think economic growth should reflect in quality of life. It seems more trees could be planted in all these new development we have. So yesterday I was talking to Raja Mohan said, have you been to Noida, all this, they, they have all these new townships. Said, yeah, but only I went to Connaught Place, which broke my heart a little bit because yeah. I love Connaught Place. <laughs> if you are. And there's a lot of things I enjoy about Connaught Place. Yeah. Why can't we clean that up a little bit? I mean, it's not an NRI criticism, by the way. You know, it's important to have a hub of a city where you show off your yeah. uh, achievements. Two yeah. weeks ago, you know, the all the school. <coughs> We are actually moving away from unipolarity. I wouldn't know whether uh, you would agree with that uh, in terms of the political or the strategic uh, dimension. But in, in the economic dimension, it definitely is. You know, because if you look at China and, and the US now, right. I mean, they have not overtaken US as yet mm -hmm. you know, in terms of nominal GDP. But if you look at GDP, PPP, they have exceeded. They are 127 sure. percent of the size of the US economy. So I see multipolarity as imminent as an economist, but I would like to have your take on it. And if that is coming, then where do you see? I mean, what is a great power? I mean, yeah. is a collective great power or? So that is another another challenge <coughs> to this definitional problem. But I would contend that. The economists themselves haven't grappled this issue. Mm. There's a disjunction between military domain, security domain, and economic domain. And often economists refuse to acknowledge this geopolitical dimension of this whole process. So sometimes one can make an argument that in the economic arena you have multiplexity, multi multiple order, a lot more. But in the security arena, it's still a contest between the United States and China. I mean, unfortunately. And China is rapidly modernizing its Navy <coughs> and uh, others. And if that becomes a central strategic contest, in particular in the naval sphere, economics will take second seat, as happened in European history all the time. You know? So this is a problem. How do you navigate? You want to maintain your economic prominence for the rising powers in particular. But the military domain, actually, the, it's quite funny. The Americans are still hoping to maintain that military dominance mm -hmm. to avoid this economic arena taking over because they can still have the coercive power. And then the ultimate say in terms of denial, denial, denying security or providing security and this interventions that they engage in. So the great powers of the day, including, let's say, Russia, if economic rationality was dominant, he shouldn't have gone into Crimea. I mean, it was just such a dumb thing to do if you look back history. And, and if economic rationality is also very important, many things Mr. Xi Jinping did, including the border needling on India, was unnecessary. I and mean, think about the, what, what did that do to his strategy. And his geopolitical ambition is affecting his economic growth rate. Look at it going down. As far as we know, there is a huge unemployment problem there, too. So. Economic rationality is not always consistent with the geopolitical ambitions of these so-called states. And same Trump, he wants to put 100% tariff. I mean, it's a suicide, don't think about it. He may not do that, but the point is, even to think on those lines is the desire to gain the old, good old status based on military power, economic, you know, my own country, important kind of thing. So there is a disjunction in these two domains. And that has always been there in the study of IPE versus security studies. In fact, I remember after the end of the Cold War, one very famous professor said, TV, are you still doing security studies? It's over, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Sir, wait a little bit. This was Jeff Friedan at Harvard. He <laughs> was my professor at UCLA, so he was a very sharp man. I was thinking, why do you say that? You know, history never ends. It's like the end of history argument. <laughs> and here we are, you know. So be careful. The economists have to be mm, careful about the tendency of countries to push their security 
status acquisition enhancement, ignoring <coughs> the economic rationality. <coughs> now, uh, to link back to the immediate proposal of the tax, I would like to begin by thanking Mr. T. Paul for joining us today for this discussion here in the science. And you have covered some really thought provoking ideas on India's search for high class stages. Thank you, sir. Uh, I would also like to thank our Dean, Professor Bajo, and the whole military leadership the school is moving forward. And his call to mark the 17th anniversary of our school and the events around it have definitely infused the new energy in our activities. And I would also like to thank all our faculty members, Professor Baba, Professor Sahani, and all others who are present over here. Special thanks are also due to the team led by Professor Preeti Singh uh, for coordinating the 70th anniversary lecture series and the members of our professor. <coughs> Dr. Rashmi, Dr. Tadi, and Dr. Shakti. Thank you so much. And last, uh, last but not least, all the students who are present over here, thank you so much. Because without your presence, this discussion would not be as meaningful as it is. Thank you so much.